Hello again. I hope that exercise was valuable and thought-provoking to you. One thing I picked up on is that uh, if you guys didn't notice, as of this point, Hector has done no work whatsoever as far as throwing a Pulaski on that fire. <laughs> uh, I can never turn down a chance to get a hold of my good buddy there. Anyways, now let's roll the video that's going to take us back to Colorado and show us what actually happened. Even though the fire was starting to lay down at this time, I did not like the idea. The crew had good intentions, as they had not seen the fire when it was making its runs. At this time, I was not comfortable with the idea and would postpone such activity until humidities and temperatures had changed dramatically. Since I was very reluctant to let them go into the impenetrable Gamble Oak and line these spots, I had them join up with the original crew of five and they would construct fire line around the right flank while the smoke jumpers would go around the left. Both the smoke jumpers and district crew continued to cut line till about 1 a.m. The humidities increased and the temperatures dropped to the point where the fire no longer was continuing to grow. We discussed all the safety considerations and decided it was okay at this time to send the smoke jumpers ahead of the fire and grid some of the green. The small group of smoke jumpers gridded the green out ahead of the fire to find the original two spots across the ravine. Subsequently, they found two more. There was no threat of being in danger at this time of the night due to the increased humidities and decreased temperatures. The spots were lined and at first light we would have the helicopter and bucket work these spots. Thanks, Hector. We appreciate you preparing that exercise for us and sharing your experiences from Colorado last year. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Teddy, uh, a couple of things. First, I'd like to emphasize the importance of good communication and collaboration with uh, coming resources on a fire such as this one. Um, the crew that uh, I collaborated with there on that corner of the fire um, that, we, that we held up, uh, they had good intentions. Uh, upon their arrival, um, the fire was pretty docile. It wasn't making any active runs. Um, I think if I would have been arriving with them at the same time, I probably would have had the same feelings they did. However, uh, they were very receptive, uh, you know, to my judgment, and I explained to them uh, where I developed such a decision, uh, being that we had seen it from the air and, and the fire activity we had seen earlier, and they were good with it. Uh, they joined up with their crew, uh, like I said, in the thing al along the uh, right flank, and uh, did a tremendous job for us. Uh, the end story of this fire is uh, we ended up getting all the resources we uh, asked for and uh, we were on this fire for three days. Uh, it was a fun fire, we all had a good time working together. Those crews and, and their people I had to keep myself and the jumpers in line most of the time. Um, final acreage of this thing, 12 acres, uh, injuries sustained none. You know, it's one of those we put to bed, uh, one of thousands of fires that are typical like this every year. Good. Um, how big were those spots, by the way? You, you know, uh, the biggest spot, uh, my, a tenth of an acre, you know, a tenth to a quarter of an acre. But they, you did work them with the helicopter the next day, so. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that too, Ted. Um, you know, we uh, lined those spots real good that night, you know, removed the heavies and such, and uh, first light in the morning, I mean, we just put them to bed with the, uh, with the helicopter in the bucket. You know, when I first looked at that exercise, <clears throat> my first impression was that Maybe you should, you know, at first I was looking at, well, getting later in the evening, I thought, well, shoot, maybe they could get out, go underneath uh, that the crew that was on the, the bottom end of that fire, head over to the spots. Um, at first I looked at it, well, you could do that and put LCES in place, uh, look at it from an LCES point of view, and I thought maybe you could actually accomplish that mission safely and pick up those spots, but, but you saw some things and, and I just wanted you to kind of go over the things that you saw that, that kept you from sending that crew over. I mean, you obviously you had a bird's eye view coming in. Mm -hmm. Hindsight, that decision, it would have worked. Uh, like I said, my gut feeling at the time was, you know, there's a lot of unburned fuel between the head of the fire, what was the head of the fire, and these spots. And if the weather conditions did change, you know, not in our favor again uh, that evening, uh, we would have had uh, some people in, in a bad situation. So, you know, I, I see why, why your judgment and, and why you would have opted for that. Well, and that, and that just, uh, the other interesting thing about this fire that, that I think uh, that I saw was normally local resources, uh, in this case, you kind of had the advantage because you saw the fire's behavior and you saw it take some runs before they showed up. But boy, most of the time, and, and you can attest to this because me and you were always working out a region, the local resources are a good resource for us. They're something that I usually ask them for local 
weather conditions, local weather patterns, and the, the local knowledge that they provide is generally invaluable. So it's kind of interesting in this scenario that, that you got there and saw some behavior before they showed up. Yeah, and, and you know, on this particular fire itself, we did use a lot of the local people for that. They knew the local protocol with uh, dispatch. Uh, you know, they knew a lot about the weather in this area. They'd been fighting fire for, you know, several weeks uh, in, in the close proximity to this fire. So we did use them, you know, for a, a lot of local knowledge, and, and they were real handy to have there. That was a good application of LCES, and once again, we're looking at a fire that didn't make the 6 o'clock news, so it was a success. Anybody else have any comments on it? I actually do, Ted. Um, Hector, I, I really like the way you, you know, set this, uh, this exercise up and explained your usage of LCES, but my main question is, is um, the proximity that you were in to the Battlement Creek um, fatality site and the South Canyon site, how did that weigh on your usage of, you know, your safety measures that you were in place, putting in place? Okay, to put that in perspective, um, you know, I think it's with any of the smoke jumpers that go down to uh, Grand Junction nowadays, you hear that you're getting a fire call towards that country and immediately a big red flag goes off. You know, you know kind of the conditions you're going to be uh, thrown into. So, uh, you know, first, first thought is, okay, we're going to that uh, Gamble Oak country over there. Second thought, when you see the big convec convection column when you're just off the ground at uh, Grand Junction, you know, you've got a second red flag that goes up, you know, so... Uh, yeah, it was a big consideration on, on why decisions were made like that in that country. And I think not only for smoke jumpers, but I think that uh, anybody that's fought fire in that country would agree with me on that. Good. Anything else? You guys got anything? I don't know. I think you answered my question. Good job. Uh, I thought that was a real good, r real good scenario that you brought up, and uh, I appreciate you sharing it with us. So anyways, why don't we uh, go ahead and change our focus now and talk a little bit about another problem that the fire community is facing at probably an increasing rate, and that is the urban wildland fire interface. This is the area of our job that seems to receive the most media attention, as well as kind of raise the hair on the back of some necks uh, for people. It's a very dangerous part of our job, and it involves some complexities that are not found in strictly wildland fire situations. The nine urban wildland watchout situations are listed on page 11 of your notebook. Let's start by getting some comments from a person who works in this area and that faces it and faces this problem uh, quite often, and that is, of course, Nicole. Nicole, what does urban interface mean to you? Well, to me, Ted, urban interface is something, you know, it raises the hair on the back of my neck like you wouldn't believe. But um, it's something, basically, that's out there in the wildland area or abutting up to the wildland area that... May you know, nature never actually intended. It's something that's man-made, whether it be a single cabin, an old uh, logging mill maybe up in, up in the northwest somewhere, or whole communities, actually. But I guess the actual definition, as stated in S205, is that line, area, or zone where structures or other human development meets or intermingles with undeveloped wildland or vegetative fuels. But um, on the Las Vegas district, most people there, you know, when they drive into southern Nevada, they're like, you know, what kind of problems do they actually have? All I see is yucca, cactus, and pretty much smart, you know, sparse fuels. But, however, in reality, we do have quite a concentration of uh, mesquite, tamarisk, salt cedar, and even heavy concentrations of ponderosa up in the mountains around there. Um, our, inter our urban interface problems lie pretty much in the fact that we are the fastest growing community in the United States at this time, and so we've got a lot of people that are moving out into areas that normally wouldn't actually be seeing this. Um, of course, we're not facing the problems such as, such as what Los Angeles or maybe the Bitterroot Valley up in Montana is facing, but we do have our own set of problems. Um, we do have, you know, a lot of small farms and dairies out in the area, um, multi-million dollar homes built up in the Ponderosa um, in the mountainsides, and we do also do a lot of work with the military on military installations and bombing ranges. Um, there in the Vegas area, we work with over 17 volunteer departments, over five different paid departments, along with the military, U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Nevada Division of Forestry. In Nevada, or actually in southern Nevada, we currently are under one unified, basically, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, you know, us. We are um, under one single FMO, an interagency FMO, so we work really closely with everybody down there. Good. Boy, it's going to be real interesting to see uh, how the problem continues to grow and see how you guys mitigate it because the population isn't, it hasn't slowed down. It's still an expanding area and it's going to be real interesting to see what happens with that. 
How about the southern area, uh, Lamar? You guys deal with a lot of cooperators, and you guys have your own set of issues down there concerning urban wildland interface. I'm totally, Ted, and, and, and I think the area, I think the southern area has done a great job of just educating the public on what's on urban interface. I think the relationship between the uh, local local agencies and federal agencies coming together, and a great example would be during the, during the Florida fires. Um, we had a whole, you had a lot of problems here, you know, initially you bring in southern area uh, uh, resources to that area, to the southern area. Um, we had a lot of, a lot of things going on there. I think, I think by going into those areas and educating the public on, on why we're there and what we're actually doing, um, just dealing with just resources and, and, and trying to build some type of partnership between them, I think the southern area has done an awesome job of doing that. Well, let's move on from there uh, for now anyways. It's, it's going to be interesting to watch the scenario develop in Las Vegas, and uh, it sure seems like everybody has their own set of complexities that they have to face. To some, it might be scattered land ownership and a lot of cooperators that complicate this problem. For others, it's, of course, the presence of military bases, like Nicole was talking about. For others, it's just a large number of volunteers and, uh, and landowners, ranchers. Um, that you have to deal with and, and all in incorporate into your fire program. Because of this, we all have to ask ourselves, just what is the most common urban wildland interface problem in your local area? Well, Brad, why don't we uh, take? Why don't you take a crack at this one and talk about some of the interface issues that the Boise faces? Well, during the 1990s, the frequency of fires involving wildland urban interface began to increase within the Lower Snake River District. Due to the increased number of fires and different agencies responding, it was determined that there was a need for mutual aid agreements and an avenue for interagency training. From that came the development of formalized agreements incorporating federal, county, city, and rural fire departments for mutual aid responses and cooperation during an emergency fire situation. Additionally came the formation of Southwestern Idaho Fire Training, SWIFT, which allowed agencies to collaborate and standardize training for firefighters who would be operating in the wildland urban interface. Some of the problems which were not atypical to the problems experienced elsewhere in the fire community were communications, training, PPE, and the limitations and capabilities of different equipment. Although not all the problems have been fixed, their large strides have been made. We have also been implementing some other unique training such as a yearly wildland urban interface fire scenario incorporating federal, county, state, and city personnel. Helicopter dip sites throughout the Boise foothills in conjunction with FEMA and Boise City and the training and use of county and city firefighters on their Lower Snake River District Hilltack crew. All these programs have been a real success. Barriers have been broken. Communications um, have developed. You're, you have a face-to-face -face working relationship with your cooperators. Um, again, large strides have been made, but not all the problems have been fixed. Sounds like you have a very swift program being uh, organized there. That's good. Actually, I do have a good question, though. Uh, the scenarios, it's real, I'm real interested in scenarios because I think we, we don't utilize them quite enough in the fire community, but you actually run a full-fledged interagency wildland urban interface scenario and involve all the cooperators. Is that, a, is that a big deal? I mean, is that a huge production that you go through every year? Yes. Uh, prior to, uh, you know, the, the start of the fire season, around May, we like to... Uh, develop a scenario incorporating all the agencies that would be involved normally. Um, you know, each year it's a different scenario. Uh, the players involved don't know what's going to be occurring. It's just like a normal dispatch. Uh, it's really a good way to get your mindset prepared for the upcoming fire season. Well, I think that that's great. I think there's a lot of uh, the program, that program that you're talking about, I think could possibly be used by other fire communities out there that are just starting urban wildland interfaces and starting those programs. Um, the National Fire Plan, of course, addresses that hazard fuel reductions around urban areas, so I think this activity is going to pick up even more. The Southeast, I mean, they've been doing it for a long time, Lamar. Do you got any advice or anything that you should add that might help 
uh, bring some light on this whole subject. Meaning in terms of RX burning and all that? Huh? RX burning, burning or even just the past uh, cooperations that you've uh, formulated with state and, and local well, agencies. And that, and that goes right back to education and actually going into some of the, the volunteer fire departments and actually sitting down talking to them and, and, and explaining them to them why we burn. Uh, I think the South's been, been really receptive to the whole, the whole idea of burning in their backyards. A lot of the refuges, a lot of the uh, federal agencies, and there are a lot of major interstates that run through refu refuges in that area. Um, I think that, that as a whole, the South does a great job of accepting fire uh, and prescribed burning in that area. Anybody else have anything to add? I guess I'd like to add one more thing. Um, when you're in that urban interface situation, the, the fire orders and the 18 watchouts don't go away. You just additionally have other watchouts which should be uh, standing out to you, which you should be noticing. I think another important point is when we are involved in that urban interface area, there's a tendency there where maybe emotions will maybe then overcome some of what we've been trained to do. And, you know, when somebody's screaming at you, you know, save my house, you know, get my dogs out of my house, you know, that's when you've really got to be on top of things and not let, not let that emotion take over from what you've been trained to do at that point. Well, that's a good point, and I don't see this problem getting any easier or less complicated uh, in the near future. So let's take a look now at what can happen when the wildland fires spread into the urban interface. Let's hear from some firefighters with recent wildland urban interface experience. What happens in a, a wildland urban interface face situation uh, like happens in a lot of situations. Uh, another example is getting around a helicopter, which, which doesn't seem to, to uh, connect right now. But, but when people get around a helicopter, they get in a frenzy for some reason. That's why they're very careful to have hell attack people to uh, keep you from going berserk and running into the tail rotor. When you get in an urban interface situation, and somebody's house is being threatened, and some homeowner is screaming in your ear, you can tend to get in sort of that elevated panic situation and maybe take more risk than you normally would. Uh, this is just something that, that uh, you need to be aware of when you get in that situation and make sure you stay focused on what your job is, what you've learned, and not what that homeowner is screaming in your ear telling you it's best for you to do. Uh, you know, keep your, keep your wits about you and, uh, and keep thinking about your 10 and 18. Uh, my main concern with the crew and the urban interface is that uh, uh, you're losing, I guess, losing control of the crew. Uh, you've got, you know, you've got uh, city fire captains, you know, people that are used to giving orders and expecting whoever they yell at to, to follow that order. And if your crew is, you, you know, the, the guy's got in his head that he wants to save the house, he wants to do a good job. Somebody of importance comes up to him and says, we need you to help carry this hose up this hill and losing control of my of the people I'm personally responsible for in that manner. Uh, that's that's my biggest concern anytime you get into a high, I guess, multi-resource area with the crew where typically, you know, we're out on the fire line away from all the outside inputs and so it's much easier to, to know your crew's going to be where you expect them to be at. Um, when I was kind of young and dumb, I, I, I really had a a feeling, and it it, it 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 almost cost us some some resources and myself maybe, um, and it was on a handline crew, and then also with engines that this happened. So um, I think the urban interface, as you, as you grow older, you start thinking, boy, that was stupid. What were we doing? You know, when we were in there originally, it was, have we got to protect everything that you know we can in the urban interface? That homeowner is going to lose loses things but you know to me it was a after I gained some experience and after a couple close calls I I'm thinking well, you know what what I needed to be thinking was more about myself and my crew than about that homeowner who might have insurance or might not and his valuables because he made a choice he made a choice to go and live out in that 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 wilderness area or that urban interface area and especially if that homeowner hasn't helped us by doing certain things that we've been trying to get people to do out when they live out there, um, I, I don't have any real heartburn. Now I come into it with a clear head about what I need to do 
and how to keep myself, my crew, and my engine safe. And, and if, if, if it isn't safe, we're going to pull out. And, and maybe some people are going to feel bad on the engine module. But um, I know myself, I've done the right thing because it was safety I was looking at for myself and the crew. What I look for in triage in an urban interface fire, um, first of all, access right off the bat, because that's how you're getting in. Some, most of the homes you know, we, in property we see these days, they're off the road. They're not right on the road. You have to drive up a drive, maybe a quarter mile back in there. So um, accessibility is, is right off the bat. Can we get in there? Can we turn around? What size of our engines can we get in there? It's too tight to get a heavy, so let's get the light in here. Um, that's number one, that's what you're looking for. Two would be, um, I'm looking for defensible spacing. You know, give me the opportunity to help you as a homeowner. Um, it's a good old saying, you know, help me help you. That's what I'm looking for. It's if you don't take the time to make and create some kind of defensible area that we can get in and defend your home, it, it's not manageable. It's an easy decision right there. No, leave it. We're going away. Um, roofs. It's, um, it's amazing how many people are building these homes and urban interfaces and putting shake roofs on. I don't know if it's cost or looks. I think it's looks. I was up in uh, Wyoming last year and somebody had built a, geez, got to be a $400,000 cabin out in the woods and they put a shake roof on it. And you're going, man, you have that kind of money, you can't afford to get some different kind of roof material. Um, also, debris piled up along the houses. You know, I don't want to have to come in with a crew and have to move four cords of wood away from the home. You know, that, that takes up time, precious time. If we do that to save that home, we may lose the neighbor's home. And that's not fair to the neighbor when they've done their part at helping us. Um, any kind of water sources help out too. You know, swimming pools, that makes it easy. I don't have to set up an engine there. It's a portable pump and three people, and we're ready to go. Homeowners may not like it too much, but you save their home and they'll understand. So as you've just seen, there are many additional challenges facing us when wildfire moves into the urban areas. It's important for us to remember that we're not trained as structural firefighters. One of our greatest strengths is knowing our limitations. Sound fireline decision making is made even more difficult in a wildland urban interface environment. The best work we can do in this area should probably take place before fire ever starts in the form of prevention, public education, mutual training, uh, agreements with our structural firefighting comrades, and establishing communication channels with cooperators. But above all, always remember that we want to keep safety first in this environment. Of course, there are tools at your disposal when you find yourself in these situations. The nine urban wildland watchout situations are in your pocket guide and they're in your workbook on page 11. So let me ask, I want to ask the panel some questions here. Nicole, do you have anything to add? Well, yeah, Ted, um, there was a lot of good information that came out of that, the previous interviews there that I kind of like to, you know, talk about. One of the things was, is one of the, one of the gentlemen was talking about, you know, helping, uh, helping us help them. Basically, you know, that goes, that goes a long way to actually helping us because, you, sometimes you have a matter of seconds, maybe minutes, to decide whether which house you're going to make a stand at. And, you know, if they've, if they've taken the time to properly prepare their homes, then we can make a stand there. Otherwise, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave that house. Um, another thing that Brad was talking about earlier is the 10, the 10 standard orders and the 18 situations that shout watch out don't go away just because we're in the urban interface area. Um, in fact, they're there present even more so. But another tool we have to help us a lot is the nine urban wildland watch out situations. Of course, these don't normally come as intuitively to us as what maybe the 10 and 18s would normally. So I think it's a really good idea that we take out, maybe take out our pocket guide and review those uh, watch outs, the urban watch outs, before we take, you know, we take action. Again, I think it's really important that we stay calm, think clearly, act decisively, and stay away from that proverbial uh, tail, tail rotor that my boss, Paul Bannister, was talking about. Yeah, exactly. Don't go berserk. <laughs> <laughs> Hector, you got anything to add on that? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, I believe that these uh, urban wildland uh, watch-out situations should be taken to heart by all firefighters from all agencies, 
on any jurisdiction you're fighting fire on. Uh, you know, my uh, first few years of smoke jumping, you know, we'd hear the urban interface thing all the time, and, and the nature of the beast back then was we'd go jump these fires out in these remote places, and rarely did we ever come across any kind of humans, uh, much less a structure, a home, or anything like that. Uh, times are changing. Uh, it's becoming uh, more of a common occurrence, uh, even with uh, our job as smoke jumpers. So uh, just like to reiterate and reemphasize that it, uh, it really is important for everybody to take this seriously. Especially with the increase in RX. Uh, and prescribed burn programs that are happening. I mean, we're utilizing all resources, not just for IA anymore, but a lot of them are becoming involved in, in prescribed fire uh, programs. Lamar, how about the southeast? And just like you were talking about RH just, just a minute ago, the same thing holds holds true. I think the <coughs> southern area does a great job in going into the to the high schools and, and, and educating uh, the kids. And what happens is that spills over to to the teachers and the parents, and, and they tell the teachers and parents about what they learned in school. Um, we do a great job in our program of going to the colleges and explaining to them what we do and, and, and how important our burning is in the Southeast. Probably helps out in your recruitment, too. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Because we get a lot of students, um, and, we go to two, and, and, and we go to a lot of the uh, ma majority of them are black colleges, and, 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 and they're not as familiar with what we do. Firefighting in general, I'm not very, very, very familiar with it, but it's definitely not familiar with RX burning and what we're doing there. Uh, that helps out big time. We get a lot of students because of that. Okay. I'm going to hit you with another question you probably won't expect, but let's assume a firefighter from the west is heading over to the southeast on a fire assignment, right. and you have an urban wildland interface situation going on. Uh, what safety concerns w would you want to let them know about that are specific to the south? East that they might not be aware of or may not have thought of when they were uh, getting there. You know, Ted, we do things differently. Um, people who come from the South do things. And you hear so much about the uh, Southern firefighters going West and the many problems that they encounter. Same thing happens when you have uh, uh, Western firefighters going back to, let's say, Florida. For instance, uh, there was there was a there was a guy that told me a long time ago. He said, "Man, yeah." You hot shots better watch yourself out here, okay? What it meant by that was, was that they do things differently. You can go, you can go to the wall all the way, okay? And and all of a sudden, you know, you, you get you get these old guys that are just steady going all day long. You get these hot shots that are going down. It's because of the heat or whatever. And they used to doing things that way. Uh, they use different different means of fighting fire. Um, we use our tools and our hands quite a bit. Uh, they use tractors, plows, and that's a big difference between the two. So a lot of firefighting is mechanical, and a lot of what we do is hands-on. So there are big differences. There are big differences in the lingo. Uh, I heard Brad and some of the other panelists talk about the lingo. Big, big difference between a rise and a, and a ridge, you know, I mean, a hollow and a valley. And so those are some of the things you got to be aware of. Yeah, the terminology. I remember a, a guy from Florida kept asking me where Tom was. That's right. Tom who? He goes, no, 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 you know, Tom, where can, where can you get Tom sheet? <laughs> Bad joke. Uh, Brad, let, let's hear about some uh, urban interface situations that you encounter in Boise. Well, you know, we, we've pretty much hit everything that uh, you could encounter throughout the, uh, the region and the areas that wildland interface is going to occur. Um, some of the points that I would like to just end on is uh, you really need to know your limitations in the areas you're working in, understand the principles of, uh, you know, wildland firefighters versus structural firefighters. Our job is to take care of the wildland, um, leave, leave the structure firefighting up to the pros. Um, other than that, you know, I think we've covered everything that needs to be covered. Um, you know, keep your head about you, take a, take a second to step back and look at the situation and uh, you know, just remember what you've learned throughout this uh, this course here. What about hazardous materials? I mean, we we breathe an awful lot of smoke in in wildland situations. What about uh, when you come upon a vehicle fire or uh, a structural fire? Can anybody just kind of elaborate on the safety issues concerned with that hazardous materials and smoke? I think the major thing that we've got to remember is that we receive some training in hazardous materials, but by no means are we experts. If you're unsure of it, stay back, stay out of the wind, you know, stay, stay away from it. We, most of us, at least on the engines, carry hazardous materials guides. You know, that'll tell us a little bit about it, but if, if, if faced with it 
and I'm uncomfortable with the situation, I'm going to call back to my dispatch and say, "Hey, you better bring in you better bring in somebody who knows what they're doing here because I'm I'm not willing to risk my people or myself in this situation." Excellent comments. Uh, that was real good. At this point, I, I think we'll give you a few minutes to work with your facilitator to discuss the urban interface issues that are specific to your area and how you can work together with your local cooperators and municipal fire departments. This is also a time to talk amongst yourselves about your experiences and concerns you have in the urban interface situations that you've encountered. So it's a good chance to share your own knowledge. We'll go ahead and let you do that right now. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 